Hello, welcome to Biomedia United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Nan Nelson, pastor. I hope you found us on our either our YouTube channel, Biomedia United Methodist Church, or our Facebook page, Biomedia UMC. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we thank you for this time together in this space on this day. We thank you that we can share our joys in our lives and entrust our cares and concerns to you to be in conversation with you in silent prayer, during a pastoral prayer, and in reciting the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. We're thankful that we can hear your word read and your word proclaimed in this time. Be with us now as we worship together in holy fellowship with you and one another in Jesus' name. Amen. We also have a website, byumedoumc.org. We hope you find us there and that you if you have any questions, you'll find our email address there, and you'll find it on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. We hope to hear from you soon. Our call to worship today comes from the New Testament of your Bible in the book of Psalms, and I will be reading Psalm 137. If you'll take out your Bibles and follow along with me, read aloud or read silently Psalm 137 in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, beginning in verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, or there our captors ask for a song, ask us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, remember, Lord, what the Edomites said did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried, tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you've done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As is our tradition in our sanctuary, as well as here in our online time of worship, we have a time of silent prayer where all of us can pray silently to God, followed by a pastoral prayer that I will pray aloud. And at the end of my prayer, you'll be invited to recite the Lord's Prayer along with me. Let us now bow in silence. Oh God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together in this space. Thank you for loving us everlastingly. A love that is unconditional. Loving us before we were born and loving us still. No matter what we have done, left undone, in the past, the present, or the future. A love that is invitational, inviting us to follow your son, Jesus. 
and to become a disciple. And as he teaches us how to live in relationship with you, and as we grow in our relationship with you, a personal relationship, your transformational love will transform us to be more like you, and we give you thanks for this love that's so great that your son Jesus came to this earth not only to teach us how to live in relationship with you, but in relationship with one another. And he gave his life on the cross for the forgiveness of all our sins. And you raised him on the third day after he was crucified, dead, and buried. You resurrected him, giving us eternal life with you. And we are forever thankful. We're thankful for all those who step into harm's way every day. The military, the law enforcers, the firefighters, the first responders, and all those who step into the aftermath of hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding and storms of any kind and blizzards and snow and ice and wildfires. And we give you thanks. And we ask your blessings and protection on all of these and all of the volunteers that step into harm's way in the aftermath of hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires and floods and all of the above. We give you thanks. We give you thanks that we can choose when and where we worship in this great land of ours and we pray that it's always so. Receive the prayers that we hold in our hearts and share only with you. Receive the prayers that we lift for the names on our personal and church prayer lists and entrust them to your care. As together we now pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament. It comes from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. If you'll turn to your Bibles again and follow along as I read from the Old Testament, 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. This is the story of Lord call, the Lord calling Samuel, beginning in verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling 
as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, or your servant is listening. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me again? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There was a Hebrew woman named Hannah, and she was barren. Hebrew theology believed that there were three parties to any conception, the mother, the father, and God. If a couple couldn't have children, it was a sign of divine disapproval, reflected on the woman, not the man. Of course, now times have changed, and through the eyes of modern medicine, we see things very differently now. But this story occurred a long, long time ago. So we see Hannah weeping in the temple and pleading with God for a child. Any child that she has, she will give back to God to be in God's service. Lo and behold, Hannah conceives and bears a son. She waits until Samuel is weaned, then takes him to Shiloh and gives him to the older priest. The message I read in 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10, takes us several more years down the road when Samuel is older. And he begins with the announcement that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions weren't widespread. That was ev evidently a very low time in the religious life of the Hebrew people in, then. The priest Eli was a descendant of the priestly family at Shiloh. And we don't know much about Eli except that he was quite old. However, we're told plenty about Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. The kindest word that the writer of 1 Samuel applies to them is scoundrels in uh, 1 Samuel 2 verse 17. God was thoroughly fed up with those boys. Evil things were going on in the temple and there wasn't any relief in sight. So God's first commandment to Samuel is for him to tell the sons of Eli that they are washed up. But that's only the beginning. Samuel became the most powerful man in all of Israel. Kings are powerful, but Samuel was a kingmaker. No individual became king without Samuel's blessing. I don't think that we, you and I, can read scriptures without being struck by the importance of children. Children are always a central part of God's plan. They become the agents of new beginnings, like the baby Moses hidden in the bulrushes, the boy Samuel, the boy Jeremiah, the manger in Bethlehem that held baby Jesus. So many chapters of biblical history begin with the birth of a child. God had this starting way, startling way of entering human history through our children who became the sign of hope and renewal. Now there's some theologians that tell us that a long time ago that we now live in a secular age. They tell us that and they point out that God speaks in the marketplace and in political events and in unexpected places. But God speaks in another place too, in the sanctuary among the people of God. Although God raises up a lot of unlikely prophets, God also raises up those such as Samuel and Isaiah who brought us in were brought up in the sanctuary. Those who from their birth are given to God. I think it's disheartening that many decades old congregations can't name a single person who's entered ministry from their ranks. It isn't an accident that some churches produce more full-time Christian workers than others do. 
In such churches, we usually find members who have exceptional vision and commitment and who have a green thumb with children. In 1976, John Westerhoff wrote a book called Will Our Children Have Faith? The title doesn't say, Will Our Children Have Knowledge? Westerhoff says that the end of the church's work with children isn't so much about knowledge as it is about faith, because faith is essential to living a Christian life. Up to now, as people, as humanity, we've dealt with the basic human needs. William Glasser identified in his choice theory, survival, love, belonging, power, freedom, and fun. And he doesn't include a specifically religious component in his theory. But I believe we Christians should also substitute the word faith for his version called survival and love and belonging, faith and loving and belonging. Faith is a vital element that makes all the other things possible, love and belonging. Love and belonging, power and freedom. Faith makes it all possible. Faith is a vital element in our lives. Some people may think that acquiring knowledge will help us with these other vital elements of love and belonging. Knowledge is good and it's necessary, but in itself, it doesn't guarantee anything. People have all kinds of knowledge that they will or that, that they can use, but it doesn't fulfill everything that we need just having knowledge. What we need is faith. Faith is the engine that powers Christian people. Faith is a way that we express the difference between knowledge and faith because knowledge is taught and faith is caught. Let me say that again. The difference between knowledge and faith, knowledge is taught, faith is caught. People get faith primarily in two ways by hearing it proclaimed, and by being around faith-filled people. The family and the church are natural workshops where we and our children put together our faith. We need both. In the book of Romans, Paul says that faith comes from what is heard. If we spend any time around children, we know that they pick up an amazing amount of information and they assemble it in fascinating ways. They're often better listeners than adults are. Though we prepare Sunday school lessons and worship and sermons with great care, we can't predict what children are going to take away from what we say. We can be sure, however, that when we earnestly speak the knowledge and the language of faith, hope and love in our churches and in our families, the effect will not be lost on even the youngest. Jesus was always looking for faith. We see this in the healing stories when he asks again and again, do you have faith? Faith is what gets people well. It's what gives us a future. It's what gives us hope. Jesus' concern about faith extended to the boundaries of history. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 8. I think it's a haunting question for us as we move forward every day, growing our faith, spending time in conversation, prayer with God, the one who created us, and reading his word. Even if it's a word or two in your Bible, pick it up and read it. Read it each day. 
you don't know what to read, just open it and read what's on the page, a verse or two. And in time, you'll want to know happened, want to know what happened before that verse you read and what came after it. And pretty soon you'll have read the whole Bible. And you will have learned about God and faith and love and hope and joy and peace. I invite you to increase your faith every day. Spend a little time with God and increase that time every day as you become transformed by God's transformational love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? Receive this blessing. May the peace and love of Jesus Christ be yours today and every day as you grow your faith and trust in him. In his name. Amen. We hope you're back with us for our online worship. It opens at 10 a.m. every Sunday morning and is available every day after that. It opens on our YouTube channel, Bayou Mito United Methodist Church at 10 a.m. and on our Facebook page, Bayou Mito UMC. Our Thursday devotional chat, Hope and Prayer for Our World, opens at 12 noon on Thursdays on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. Until we meet again, may God bless you.